Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail Critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains so fuzzy and cute, and this video is going to be a little bit depressing, and I want to preface that with... Yeah, I, I need you to understand that if you like animals, some of this is going to make you really, really sad. Because we are talking about times when animals were used for war. And not like just bomb-sniffing dogs or, you know, mascot animals for, you know, morale purposes. I mean, those have happened too, and those are very wholesome, adorable stories. No, 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 no. These are times where the animals were used as a weapon and not always with their lives taken into account. These are five times where animals were used as weapons of war. Bat bombs. Why would you use bats as bombs? Bats aren't b bats are- No, don't actually do that! Though I guess it is October, so it's a good thing I'm talking about bats. Bats are all spooky and woo and that, and they normally don't explode. But in this case, they were designed to do that exact thing. This is a United States project, too, that was experimented with during World War II. The concept was made up by Little S. Adams, who was a dental surgeon and acquaintance of First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. A dental surgeon? created the concept for exploding bats. I don't... If I didn't have several different sources, I wouldn't believe a word of this. I just want to stress that. Okay, so Little thought that they could create incendiary bats to utilize during World War II. This was right after Pearl Harbor, so the United States was looking for any and all possibilities for weapons to use in the war, and President Roosevelt totally approved the plan. At least, the plan to experiment with it. The United States Army Air Force took over from there, and Adams assembled workers for the project, which included a mammologist, Jack Von Bloker, actor, Tim Holt. Yes, really. I, I swear, I'm not making this up, I promise! A former gangster, a former hotel manager... Did you just go out in the streets of LA and pick up everyone you could find? Like, that's what this sounds like. Allegedly, some of the members were self-described bat lovers, but they later noted that it didn't occur to any of them to question the morality or the ecological consequences of sacrificing a few million bats for the war. There were several variables to work out. First of all, the species of bat they were even going to work with. They had a few options, but they eventually settled with the Mexican free-tailed bat. Additionally, they also had to decide what kind of explosives were going to be glued to the bats. Yes, glued to the bats. At first, they were going to use white phosphorus, but then Louis Pfizer joined the team, and he showed off his invention, napalm. Napalm is, uh, well, very dangerous, very fiery, and it totally would be effective for the purposes they were trying to use it for. The plan was for the bats to spread the napalm all over the place, creating effectively firebombs, but bat-based. The bats, because they could fly, would spread the explosions over a much wider area, lighting buildings on fire as they went. Of course, this would kill the bats, because... duh. But the damage they could get out of it might be better than traditional explosives of the time. The napalm was stored in a small cellulose container that they dubbed H2 units. And like I said, they were attached to the bats using an adhesive. Each bat could carry between 15 to 18 grams, in addition to their 14 gram weight. The bats were then put in a sheet metal tube that was approximately 1.5 meters in length. Each carrier held about 1,040 bats. Once the carrier was dropped from an airplane like a bomb, it would descend to an altitude of about 1,200 meters, or 4,000 feet, before deploying parachutes. The sides of the carrier would fall away, and the bats would disperse. However, testing was a little, uh, rocky, to say the least, or rather, inflammatory, because the bats were completely unpredictable. They were gonna do what they were gonna do, and if they were lit on fire in mid-flight, they didn't exactly like that very much. During one accidental release on May 15th, 1943, Carlsbad Army Airfield Auxiliary Air Base was set on fire. 
So that was, that was bad. And after that happened, the project was sent to the Navy instead. And they called it Project X-Ray. And then they cast it off to the Marine Corps in December of 1943. The Marines moved operations to the Marine Corps Air Station at El Centro, California, and after several experiments, the definitive test was carried out on what they called the Japanese Village, which was a mock-up of a typical Japanese city that was built by the Chemical Warfare Service. The Marines' testing was actually pretty good in terms of delivery. Like, once the bats were let out, they set fire to the buildings, and that was what they were supposed to be for. The problem was, it was determined that the project wouldn't actually be ready until the middle of 1945, and it was also really expensive. These bats weren't necessarily cheap, in a sense, and it was felt the development was just going too slowly. Especially when, on the back end, many of the higher-ups knew that they were also working on the atomic bomb which could probably provide a significant amount of devastation and be at least a little more predictable. Adams still felt that his bat bomb would have been a better option because, since they were designed to light buildings on fire, it would have given people a chance to get away. It still would have caused mass devastation, but not with the catastrophic loss of life of an atomic bomb. Seems like a weird line to straddle, if you ask me. Also, um, the bats didn't die, so that, that, that was nice too. Do you like bats? Because this is horrible if you like bats. So many bats were lit on fire for this project, we're just saying. Rat bombs. Why are we- why- why are we doing this? Why are we just blowing up animals? Is there a trend? Actually, yeah, it is a trend. I think four out of the five here involve blowing up the animal. Though, in fairness, in this instance, the rats were already dead. And this weapon was developed by the British Special Operations Executive, or SOE. Again, during World War II for use against Germany. Why would you want to fill rat carcasses, dead rats, with plastic explosives? That's what they were doing. Why would you do that? Why would you ever do that? Well, it had some logic, and the thinking was that when a dead rat was discovered in a boiler room of a locomotive, a factory, a power station, or anything else that involved a steam boiler, the stoker tending the boiler would dispose of the dead rat by shoveling it into the furnace. This would cause the explosives to go off. Back in those days, plastic explosives were a lot more unstable than modern ones. You could set it on fire and it would go off. So, in this instance, the explosion might be enough to trigger a boiler explosion, which, as we've discussed many times in this channel, is a very bad thing that can cause a whole heap of devastation. But this was never actually deployed. Well, they tried to, but the first shipment was intercepted by the Germans. And because the Germans got wise to it, the plan was dropped entirely, though it wasn't considered a complete failure, in fact, it was kind of considered a success. Because, because when the Germans figured out that there were explosives and dead rats, they showed them off at their top military schools and conducted expensive searches for further exploding rats, completely wasting their time. So in that regard, they could call it a success because, well, they at least wasted the Germans' time. And in this war, any kind of victory is a victory. Anti-tank dogs. Now, listen to me. And I'm being very real here. I love dogs, okay? I love animals in general, but I especially love dogs. Who doesn't love a dog? They're adorable. They're good boys and girls. This story is very upsetting if you like dogs, okay? You have been warned. So, anti-tank dogs. How is a dog going to take on a tank? Well, this experiment could be traced back to the Soviet Union, and in 1924, the Revolutionary Military Council of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics man, they like their long names, approved the use of dogs for military purposes. Now, dogs get used in the military even now. They're smart animals, and generally they're used for bomb sniffing. But that isn't really what the Soviets wound up doing with them. They experimented with a wide range of tasks initially, such as search and rescue, which dogs are good at, so fair enough, delivery of first aid communication, tracking mines and people, assisting in combat, transporting food, medicine, and injured soldiers on sleds, and the destruction of enemy targets. It's the last one that we want to focus on this time. The idea of using dogs as mobile mines was developed during the 30s, as well as a specially designed mine that could be fitted to the dogs. A specialized training school was founded in the Moscow Oblast, and then 12 more regional schools were opened later. 
three of which trained anti-tank dogs. Now, the workers in Peasant's Red Army didn't actually have dedicated dog trainers in the 30s, so they had to use hunters, police, and even circus trainers instead. Several animal scientists were also involved, and German Shepherd dogs were favored for the program for their physical abilities and ease of training, but other breeds were also used. And that's very upsetting. I love German Shepherds. They're one of my favorites, and this is making me very upset already. I just want you to know what I am emotionally going through to tell you this story, okay? The original idea, in their defense, didn't involve killing the dogs. See, they thought the dog could carry a bomb that was strapped to its body, and reach a specific static target. Then the dog could release the bomb by pulling with its teeth a self-releasing belt, and then return to the operator. The bomb could be detonated by a timer or a remote control after that. Dogs were trained in this for six months, but the problem was that they really couldn't get their heads around the idea. They performed well on a single target, but they got really confused if the target or the location was changed, and tended to return to the operator with the bomb unreleased. Which, uh, if they were using a timer and in a live situation, could have killed everybody, so that was bad. Instead, it was decided that the bomb would be detonated upon contact with the target. That would kill the dog, but it would destroy the tank as well. And in a war situation, a one dog may be worth a lot less than killing an enemy tank. They also simplified target acquisition. Instead of trying to locate a very specific target, the dogs just had to find any enemy tank. It didn't matter. Is it an enemy tank? Just, just find the, the just find a tank. Just, it, 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 just, if it's an enemy tank, you just find that tank. The dogs were trained pretty horrifically by being kept hungry, and their food was placed under tanks. The tanks were first left standing still, but then they had their engines running, which they then ramped up to sporadic blank shot gunfire and other battle-related distractions. This routine let the dogs learn to run under the tanks in battlefield situations. They were each fitted with 10 to 12 kilogram, or 22 to 26 pound, mines, which was carried in two canvas pouches adjusted individually to each dog. The mines had a safety pin, and that was removed right before they deployed. Each mine carried no markings and was not supposed to be disarmed. A wooden lever extended out of the pouch to about 20 centimeters in height, when the dog dove under a tank, the lever struck the bottom of the tank and detonated the charge. Because the underparts of the chassis were the most vulnerable of tanks, it was hoped that the explosion should be able to disable the vehicle. In World War II, they were deployed. About 40,000 dogs to be precise. Not all of those were specifically anti-tank dogs, but many of them were. The dogs arrived on the front line in 1941. But in an active war situation, the whole program actually had a lot of problems. Other than the horrific nature of blowing up a dog, which I already, again, don't like at all. I can't stress that enough. But it really didn't work that well. In order to save on fuel and ammunition, the dogs had been trained on tanks which stood still for the most part. In the field, the dogs didn't like diving under moving tanks, and gunfire from the tanks actually scared away many of the dogs. They would often run back to their trenches, and then detonated the charge upon jumping in, which killed their own soldiers. To prevent this, the returning dogs had to be shot, often by their own controllers, and this made the trainers really unwilling to work with any new dogs. They didn't want to bond with these smart, intelligent animals if they were going to have to kill them themselves. It was already bad enough that they were effectively sending the dogs to their death, but now they were expected to shoot them if they came back. It was not psychologically good for the trainers at all. Of course, this is the Soviet Red Army, and their top brass is controlled by Stalin! So, you know, not really a situation where saying no might be an option, but I'm just saying. Remember that Soviet Russia's methodology when it came to fighting back the Germans was effectively to throw all the people in the universe into the Blitzkrieg buzzsaw. And it worked, because they just had more people in Soviet Russia. But that doesn't mean that it wasn't any less horrific for the people involved in the conflict. And many openly criticized the program, saying that the army did not stop with sacrificing people to the war, and went on to slaughter dogs too. But they were often persecuted later by s <clears throat> special departments. Out of the first group of 30 dogs that were deployed, only four managed to detonate their bombs near German tanks, and that inflicted an unknown amount of damage. 
Six exploded upon returning to the trenches, and three dogs were shot by German troops. It actually contributed to Germany's propaganda campaign, as it began saying that Soviet soldiers refused to fight, and they had to send dogs instead. Another mistake was also realized later. The Soviets had reasonably used their own tanks when they were training the dogs. The problem was that Soviet tanks were diesel-driven. The Germans used gasoline. Not only do these two types of engines sound a little bit differently, but dogs rely on their acute sense of smell, and gasoline and diesel fuels burn a little bit differently. So they often sought out Soviet tanks instead, which smelled more familiar to them, and blew up their own tanks. The overall efficiency of the program remains kind of uncertain. Soviet sources say that around 300 German tanks were damaged by the anti-tank dogs, but that claim on its own isn't even that high. Also, it's considered inflated by Soviet propaganda. So, it's unknown exactly how many were successful, but it's pretty clear that this program didn't work that well. And that's on top of the animal rights issues we got going on here. The Germans also grew wise to the dogs pretty quickly, and began shooting any dog they saw in combat areas. After 1942, the use of the dogs declined rapidly, and the training schools were redirected to produce more needed mind-seeking and delivery dogs, a much better use of their intelligence and abilities. The Japanese actually had a similar program as well, though in their case they were going to use the dogs to destroy bunkers. The issue was that the dogs often took the explosives and returned with them, scared by enemy fire, so the whole thing was cancelled before they were ever really, truly deployed. Either way, that's just all agree to not hurt dogs. Like, I don't, I don't like it. I don't like any of this. I, I don't, I didn't like having to tell you that story. I'm sorry. The U.S. Navy Marine Mammal Program. Okay, this is a lot more wholesome. And we need that right now. We need, we need something to, to bring our brains back from all the horrific animal death I've just had to tell you about. This story, no animals die. The program does not involve blowing up any animals at all. So, we like that. The Marine Mammal Program for the United States Navy dates back to 1959, and the Navy has actually trained dolphins and sea lions as teammates for their own personnel. Why would they want to do this? Well, both animals, for one thing, are incredibly smart. Several other animals were actually utilized over the years for testing, including sharks and rays, although eventually, and more recently, they settled on bottlenose dolphins and California sea lions. Both species are very, very, very easy to train, and very adaptable to a wide range of environments. But again, what are they using them for? Are they just putting on a show for, you know, morale? Well, no. They actually are utilized in effectively battle scenarios, but not in the way you'd think. The dolphins, in particular, actually possess the most sophisticated sonar that's known to science. Dolphin echolocation is just insane. Even our modern sonar can't necessarily compete with a dolphin's ability to find things underwater. Mines and other potentially dangerous objects on the ocean floor that are difficult to detect with our electronic sonars are actually easily found by dolphins. Dolphins and sea lions both have excellent low-light vision and underwater directional hearing, and that allows both of them to detect and track undersea targets, even if the waters are dark and murky. They can also dive hundreds of feet below the surface without risking decompression sickness that human divers would otherwise have to deal with. Mostly, they're utilized in recovery operations, trying to get dangerous equipment that was either left behind during a war or during a testing exercise off the ocean floor where it could do no harm. Dolphins are trained to search for and mark the location of undersea mines that could threaten the safety of those on board military or civilian ships. Both the dolphins and sea lions are also trained to assist security personnel in detecting and apprehending unauthorized swimmers and divers in areas. The program has also been a huge boost to science. Caring for and working with the marine mammals has generated over 1,200 scientific publications in the open scientific literature on their health, physiology, sensory systems, and behavior. People in general usually like working with animals, especially smart ones. Navy personnel tends to bond with the dolphins and the sea lions, and it's good for morale in general. Given the program has lasted a half a century, it seems to be really effective, though it is on the decline. See, underwater drones are being looked at as possibly more effective than the sea lions or the dolphins. Not necessarily because their electronic sonars are any better, 
or actually they might be worse, it's just the upkeep. The dolphins and sea lions are living, breathing animals. They require a certain amount of care and therefore money. The drones don't. They're drones. So they don't need to be given, say, fish to be happy. If a dolphin finds a mine, it expects a fish. Okay, give it the fish. Look at him. Look at him. He found the mine. Give him a fish. A drone doesn't expect the fish. You don't have to worry about that. So, from a financial and management perspective, the drones are seen as better in that regard. But they haven't quite replaced the dolphins just yet. So even now, there's still a team of Navy sailors that's just having a ton of fun training with some bottlenose dolphins. And that is so much better than the previous story. Oh my god, I'm so sorry the last story I had to go back to animal death. That's what's about to happen, I'm just warning you now. Project Pigeon. Now you might be thinking that I'm talking about the carrier pigeons from World War One, And that's a good topic that I'm not going to get into right now, because no, I'm not talking about them at all. Though I will say the carrier pigeons were instrumental during World War One. They were able to deliver messages long distance very accurately and help that war effort. But this was World War II, and by that point we had radio. So we didn't need carrier pigeons anymore, but what if we used the pigeons instead to help guide bombs? Not fly next to bombs or missiles or whatever and guide them in that way. No, I mean stick a pigeon inside an explosive bomb and guide it from within like a little tiny suicide bomber. This is horrible! The program can be sourced at American behaviorist B.F. Skinner, and the testbed they used for it was the same National Borough of Standards developed unpowered airframe that was later used for the U.S. Navy's radar-guided bat glide bomb. Not, not an actual bat bomb, that was just a regular bomb that could glide. It wasn't using bats like before, I just want to stress that. They're basically small gliders with explosive warheads in the center, as well as a guidance section in the nose cone. The pigeons were supposed to be trained to act as pilots for the device, using their cognitive abilities to recognize the target. The guidance system consisted of three different lenses that were each mounted on the nose of the vehicle. The lenses projected an image of the target on a screen that was mounted in a small compartment inside the nose cone. This screen was mounted on pivots and fitted with sensors that measured any angular movements. One to three pigeons, which were trained to recognize the target, were stationed in front of that screen. When they saw the target, they would peck at the screen with their beaks. Their training consisted of being shown an image of the target, and any time they pecked at it, they'd be given some seed. As long as the target remained in the center of the screen, the screen would not move. But if the bomb began to go off track, the image would move towards the edge of the screen. The pigeons would then follow the image, peck at it, and that would move the screen on its pivots and move the bomb back on course. Even though the National Defense Research Committee saw the idea as being ridiculous, they still contributed $25,000 to research in it anyway. It was World War II, they were up for whatever, that's, that, that's the way it was at the time. Skinner complained that no one would take him seriously. Really? Why? I can't imagine the issues here. And the program wound up being cancelled on October 8th, 1944, because the military believed that further prosecution of this project would seriously delay others, which in the minds of the division have more immediate promise of combat application. Though, believe it or not, this whole thing was actually revived after the war by the Navy. In 1948, they started doing it again and called it Project Orkin. But it was cancelled in 1953 because electronic guidance systems were finally coming into the fold. The electronic systems were not only more reliable, but also way more moral in the grand scheme of things. I mean, it's hard to call a bomb moral because it is designed to hit a target and blow things up, which could very easily kill a whole bunch of people. But, you know, at least in the electronic sense, we don't have to worry about killing any pigeons, so I don't know, this is a weird line to straddle for me. I'm just saying I just prefer to avoid killing any animals if we gotta go to war. That's where I'm at with it. Is that, is that okay? Is that, is that a fair statement to make? You know, go to war, but at least don't get any animals killed. They didn't do anything, okay? They're just chilling. The pigeons just wanted some seed and you put them in a bomb. It's not very nice at all. This was a hard video to make. Oh boy. And with that, a special thank you goes to all my underwater trade finders. Thomas Ward, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Some Dude 267, Orange Glass, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hot 444, 
Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsune 131-232, Mr. Black Rose, Master of None, Josh Johnson, Twin Fox, Dime Blade 17, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Alaric Jaspers, DM Tribal Typhoon, Tommy Rossini, Jack Carson's Railroad Videos, Ty Hammonds Jr., and Ohio Trucker 1. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.